I will be, I am recording this lecture again. So uh, just keep that in mind for when you're uh, asking questions. Uh, of course, you can ask either through the uh, group chat window or, uh, or just by voice. And of course, use the uh, raise hand feature if you want to get my attention. Uh, but today, I think, uh, I think it should be another uh, somewhat shorter lecture. It's just kind of one topic about polarization that, and how to change polarization that I want to talk about. It's kind of similar to the uh, two effects we talked about uh, on Monday. Uh, however, it's slightly different in that instead of converting from like linear polarized light to circular polarized light, this effect convert kind of just rotates linear polarization. And uh, that's called optical activity. So as kind of a uh, picture of what this, what this is, optical activity is something uh, like this, where we have light of a certain polarization. Uh, see if you see my laser pointer here. That is moving into a material. And that material slowly rotates the polarization uh, to a different angle. This is called an optically active material. And it's due to the fact that uh, the molecules of the material can be what we call right or left handed. Uh, they kind of are, they curl and rotate in a certain way. Uh, this is kind of similar, you may think this is kind of similar to uh, circular polarization. Uh, the one difference is that's much slower. Circular polarization, the direction of the electric field rotates once every every crest and trough so basically once per wavelength the electric field rotates here it's a much slower effect it takes many different cycles and a, over the course of a uh, fairly thick material do we see this uh, effect so uh here basically the polar is the amount of total rotation we get determines just how uh, rotated and curled the molecules are and in what direction. So this is what we call the chirality of the material and how thick our block of material is. So the, the thicker we make this block, the more the polarization would rotate. If we could make it thick enough, we could rotate it a full 360 degrees and the output uh, polarization would be the same as the input. Basically, chiral substances can be broken up into two types. Uh, they're right-handed, which means the molecules tend to be organized such that they curl and rotate in like a, a counterclockwise direction. Left-handed, they rotate the uh, opposite way. You don't really need to remember these terms, but these are the terms that you might see used in chemistry, for instance. But we're, we're just going to call them right-handed and left-handed molecules. Uh, sometimes uh, also chemists will use R and S, R for right-handed, uh, S for left-handed, but they don't, those terms don't directly indicate right versus left, but they're related. So all of these things basically uh, uh, relate to something like this. So this is kind of a cartoon picture of a molecule, like a, a perfectly helical shaped molecule. And we consider like the, so it looks like a spring and the atoms in the molecule are kind of organized to make this shape. And this would be called essentially like a right-handed molecule. The molecule is kind of rotating. It's built to kind of, from our direction, it has a, spe a specific type of rotation direction. And, uh, the reason why we have this polarization rotation is because molecules like this, if a material is made up of molecules that have this kind of property, every linear polarization can be broken up into right or left circular polarization. So the right circular component kind of rotates along with the molecule, where the left circular component does not. And this causes them to see different indices of refraction and they get different phase delays when they propagate through a block made of molecules like this. 
So uh, this induces that a phase shift between the right and left circularly polarized light, which makes the overall linear polarization of the light wave point in a different direction. Really what the molecules look like or kind of what's more similar is something like this. Uh, most molecules are not perfectly chiral or helical, but you can have molecules that have opposite what we call handedness. So here, it's kind of like if you hold up your right and left hand, they have similar shapes, but they are not perfectly, you can't replace your right hand with your left hand and have the same effect. The thumb would be on the wrong side of your arm. And it's similar with these molecules where they have the same shape, but you'll see these kind of red atoms over here. If you just switch these two molecules, all of a sudden the red atoms will be on the inside of the molecule, the white hand outside. If you switch where these two molecules are, the handedness of the entire structure is different. So essentially things that are chiral are mirror images of each other, kind of like your right and left hand are mirror images. This is something that's studied in chemistry a lot, uh, in particular because there's been this like, uh, whether a molecule is right or left-handed, if otherwise the chemical structure is completely the same, but we change whether it's organized in a right or left-handed fashion, it could have wildly different chemical and biological effects. So it, it's kind of like a historical analog of this. The, uh, this thing called the thalidomide disaster was uh, uh, a German drug company made a drug that uh, was supposed to cure morning sickness in pregnant women. Uh, and it turns out that the right-handed version of the molecule is perfectly healthy and does just that. But when they fabricated or kind of produced the drug, they produced equal amounts of right-handed and uh, left-handed versions of the molecules. And uh, the problem was the left-handed version, once it got into our system, broke down a lot of very important proteins and caused a lot of birth defects in about 46 different countries worldwide. And uh, the USA actually avoided this tragedy because the FDA and uh, Dr. Kelsey who's shown here uh, withheld approval just because they wanted to do further safety studies. So it's really a, a pretty cool story if you guys wanna go look it up uh, later. So right and left-handed molecules can have wildly different uh, chemical effects, wildly different biological effects. And also, as we see in, in optics, they have different effects on how they affect light uh, moving through a material. So for instance here, uh, let's actually think about our, uh, our light propagating through uh, material made of chiral molecules. So as with any kind of birefringent medium, there's a, uh, uh, what we would call uh, principal axes uh, are the kind of symmetry axes of the material. So what we have here is we have a light wave coming in from the bottom of the screen like this. And it's a linearly polarized light wave, but once it hits the block of this chiral material, the left-handed and right-handed polarizations are the principal polarizations. This chiral effect breaks them apart such that it puts this phase difference between right and left circularly polarized light. And overall, this causes the net linear polarization to change direction. So really what we're seeing here, a chiral molecule or a, or a block of uh, solid material made of chiral molecules, right-handed polarized, circularly polarized light sees one index of refraction and left-handed circularly polarized light sees another. So here the left-handed would uh, be the green uh, circularly, the green polarization, and that would be seeing a higher index of refraction because it's slowed down more. That makes sense to anyone? Everyone, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat, but hopefully this is clear. 
So really, if we want to consider how the polarization, the overall angle at which the linear polarization changes, that's going to be determined by just how much phase shift we get between these two different components. Here's an animation of this effect happening. So if you look at it over here, uh, and when I have these animated GIFs, my laser pointer here is uh, lagging a bit. So hopefully I can get this to work. So before we hit the block of the chiral medium is this orange block here. And the overall linear polarization going in is, I guess you could say, horizontal along the y direction in this coordinate system. And that's the thick blue line. What the chiral medium does is break up this linear polarization into the two right and left circular components that make it up. And those, so the right is the red uh, component vector. Green is the left-handed circular component vector. As we hit the medium, the green, the left-handed circular polarization is slowed down relative to the right, which uh, changes the angle at which the two polarizations add up, uh, meet and add up constructively. So that changes the overall where our polarization, uh, linear polarization direction is, which you can kind of see happening here. Hopefully this is kind of clear to everyone. Uh, so when we get out to the other side over here, you can see that now the right and left circular components are meeting and constructively interfering along this angle. So essentially along 45 degrees from where they started over here. And this is fundamentally the, uh, the idea of optical activity. Uh, we change the relative speeds of the right and left circular polarized components, and that changes the overall direction of the linear polarization. Any questions so far? All right. Uh, if not, then let's, uh, let's take a look at this and see where we see this effect in uh, in our uh, in the real world, so the common example of the uh, of optical activity, chiral molecules and solid materials made up of them are uh, not so they they exist, but they're not super common. Instead, it's much more it's much more likely that you're going to see this effect as an induced effect, and uh, you can induce this effect with a magnetic field. And when we do that, it's called the Faraday effect. For those of you that have taken, uh, if any of you have taken advanced lab uh, yet, you might have done the Faraday effect experiment. We do an advanced lab where uh, we apply a magnetic field to what is essentially a, a rod of glass. And uh, that glass is mostly insulating, but there's some uh, currents that can form uh, in there, but it's mostly ins insulating. But we usually apply that magnetic field by wrapping a coil, several coils of wire around the material. And it puts this magnetic field in the uh, center. So what happens here is we could send in polarized light. So here we're sending in light polarized uh, vertically on the screen. And it hits this, optic, uh, this glass rod. And if we didn't have a magnetic field there, the polarization would come out the same direction. If, however, we apply a current and create a magnetic field, what happens is we, would, we could rotate the polarization so that, for instance, the polarization is pointing out of the page here. That's what these circles represent. The reason uh, the amount of magnetic field generally will determine just how much ro rotation you get. And uh, the direction the polarization will be rotated depends on the direction of the current in the coils of the wire. The main reason this happens is because uh, when you apply this magnetic field, uh, even though we don't get large scale currents in the insulating glass block, the magnetic field will cause electrons to locally kind of circle the magnetic field. 
So it'll cause this kind of local, very subatomic circular motion of the electron. And the two different components of the linear polarized light, the right and left circular polarizations, one of them will see electrons that are circulating along with the electric field. The other polarization will see the exact opposite. And this will lead to have each, each uh, component to have different indices of refraction. So it causes this phase shift between right and left circular components, thus rotating the overall linear polarization. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Any questions there? Mm, nope. I... Okay. So really the only thing we're going to be doing with this kind of moving forward is uh, the where you might see this is with predicting the uh, polarization rotation in a Faraday effect experiment. Uh, we do it in lab because this is kind of a nice applied effect. It's a way, uh, I'm going to show you one application before the end, but Basically, numerically, it's quite simple to predict the uh, change in rotation angle of the polarized light. So essentially, it's uh, proportional to the magnetic field and the thickness or the distance you travel through this glass block with the magnetic field in it. So for instance, here, D, D is the distance or the thickness of our glass rod. V is our magnetic field. and Delta phi, that's, it's not a phase difference. That's the overall change in polarization angle for the linearly polarized light. So if we, for instance here, if we sent our laser beam or a light beam through a glass block with this magnetic field V, and uh, the polarization direction rotated 45 degrees by the time we got to the other side, delta phi would be 45 degrees. If we rotate it counterclockwise, delta phi would be positive. If we rotate it clockwise, delta phi would be negative. The proportionality constant is this curly letter V here. Uh, it's called, it's a property of the material and it's called the Burdett constant. Uh, depending on, basically it's a measure of just how much uh, of this local circular electron motion you can excite in the material. The higher the Verdeck constant, uh, the more circular motion you can excite with the applied magnetic field, and thus the bigger polarization rotation you get. So you can do this for liquids and solids. Uh, this is again a table with uh, CGS units rather than uh, SI units. But we're, we're working with kind of uh, yellowish light here, 578 nanometers, Green, yellow, really. Uh, so generally, the more dense a material gets, the higher it's for Verdeck constant. For gases, it's usually a quite small effect, uh, though you can see this. Uh, salt and quartz, it's a bit higher. In glasses, it's about 0.032. Uh, this definition arc minute is a, a fraction of a degree, really. So. But in the end, like this table is just kind of to show you that this effect is biggest for things like glass and uh, things that you could have like solid, dense blocks of it. Uh, if you tried to do this in gases, it's possible to see, but uh, it's much, much smaller effect, orders of magnitude smaller. So in, in advanced lab, we do this with a, uh, a glass rod that's inside of a, uh, inside of a solenoid, a set of coils of, of wire. So it's more or less exactly as pictured on these slides. One of the applications of this and why it's talked about a lot in optics is that it allows, this, allows us to build this thing called an optical isolator, uh, which is really useful in lasers because for, to get a stable laser beam, you don't want to have a case uh, where any optic in the, in the system reflects the beam directly back into the laser. 
for a lot of lasers, you could still get a decent beam out, but it, it'll, you know, cause noise and power fluctuations. So the Faraday effect allows us to do something like this. We could polarize the laser and then rotate the polarization uh, such that we reflect the beam in a different direction so that it doesn't get back into the laser. Here's kind of a way we can do that. So we could think for here about having our material that exhibits Faraday rotation. So we have a glass block here with an applied magnetic field. That's the center block. Uh, and on either side of it, we have some birefringent material that splits, uh, splits our light coming from our laser into two different components. So we can make this symmetric so that when light comes through from the laser, it's split into two different components. The components are both uh, individually rotated by the same amount and then are brought back together with the overall polarization rotated a bit. Then if we have a mirror or something here that has some weird back reflection uh, that we don't wanna get back into the laser and throw off the power or the stability, uh, that backward beam that's being reflected, as it goes through this material, it will again be split into two different polarizations. But when they go backwards through the material, uh, the rotation that we get is going to depend on minus V. So the, uh, the polarization rotation changes such that when we get into this birefringent material, the index of refraction ends up separating the beams rather than bringing them back together. So the original laser like output might be here. So the, this uh, device called an optical isolator splits the two beams such that then you could put like a block here and some kind of block here to prevent either of these beams going back or just split them enough so that they hit the outside of the laser instead of hitting the, the like actual aperture of the laser. So you see these type of devices in uh, in optical systems a lot. They're usually commercial things that you can buy. Uh, and they're usually contained within like closed box systems, usually with an optical fiber uh, input on one side and another. So this allows, uh, uh, the Faraday effect is kind of used all the time in, in laser optics. That's why it's worth talking about at least one, as we talk polarization, talking about at least briefly. Do you guys have uh, any any questions on this point? No. Okay, seems like not. So again, uh, this is kind of the last uh, the last real application of polarization and controlling polarization I wanted to do. Uh, you should be now at a point where you can go, uh, this problem, which is in the slide set, should be posted on top of the Canvas page. Uh, you should have enough information to go through this problem. One of these, uh, part A here, is you're making a wave plate, uh, kind of a static wave plate. This is similar to a problem we did in class uh, before we left for spring break. And then part B here, uh, relates to the Pockels effect that we talked about on Monday. So for now, no problem with the Faraday effect, but there might be one coming in the future. Uh, but as for uh, moving forward, we're gonna finish kind of our discussion of polarization on Friday. And basically what we're gonna do, that'll be a more mathematical lecture with more like kind of problem-based stuff, is we're gonna figure out how we can represent all of these different types of polarization changing devices as matrices, and then use some matrix mathematics to predict how the polarization uh, would change. It allows us to get around thinking about all the phase factors and uh, exponentials in the problem. So we'll hopefully build up some kind of uh, mathematical language to uh, represent these different types of devices and how they change polarization pretty uh, pretty easily, easily. So uh, that's what we're gonna do on Friday. If you guys wanna hang out and talk about homework for a bit, I'll, I'll hang out for a bit, but that's really 
what I wanted to do today. Otherwise, I'll see you guys all have office hours again uh, tomorrow at 1230 to talk about homework if you want. And uh, then we'll kind of start with the more mathematical stuff uh, on Friday. So at this point, I'll uh, stop recording and post this uh, in a bit onto the YouTube link.